boot camps are really hot right now. He's going to tell you exactly how much. Give it up for David. Hey guys, um, after seeing that previous presentation, I realized I need to clarify one thing uh, up ahead of time. I did not go to a graphic design boot camp, and this presentation reflects it. Uh, we've got about 15 minutes, and I, I want to leave extra space for questions, and there are about 12 weeks in a typical boot camp. So that's about a minute per week of the student experience. But before that, um, I just want to tell you why I'm presenting about this in the first place. So I originally went to college for Earth Sciences, and uh, my first job out of college was at National Geographic. And there are two relevant things that I, uh, that I did there. One was uh, study the Common Core Standards, which sounds really random, but it's going to come up later in the presentation. And the other thing was uh, look at this circa 2011, 2012 brand new phenomenon, which is all these online courses, including a lot of fairly promising online courses for programming. But I wasn't going to be a programmer, so I didn't actually take any when I was studying them. Um, I come from a family of educators, which is another reason I'm interested in this. Uh, like every, like my, my one sibling, both my parents, almost all my aunts and uncles are either teachers or professors. And so as a rite of passage, um, I became a math teacher and actually quite enjoyed it. But uh, once I moved out to California, uh, I started getting more and more interested in programming. My best friend has been a programmer his entire life. He's been telling me forever to get into it. Um, he was an early mentor. And uh, just as in terms of the background that led to this presentation, um, starting years ago, I, I basically just started going to, to programming meetups from here to uh, Walnut Creek, California, all the time. Um, I was interested not only in learning at the meetups, but in the meetups themselves and the sort of like the educational environments that did or did not exist at certain meetups. Um, so yeah, I went, I went to a school called Holberton. And uh, this presentation isn't actually about that because that would be boring both for, for me and for you. Uh, I applied to so many coding schools. Uh, I actually, I don't remember. Um, like sometimes I'll like see a logo for one. I'll be like, oh yeah, like I, I interviewed there. Like um, it's just been, uh, it, it's been a long road. Uh, and I, I, I'd rather talk about some of the, the general uh, phenomena that happen at these coding schools. And also, uh, when I go to these meetups, uh, I hear a lot of people talking about them. And uh, sometimes, like, engineering managers, or I have a couple of friends who are, uh, who are recruiters, will talk about the sort of, like, black box, box phenomenon, where, like, the marketing is often very similar, the websites are often very similar. And uh, in, unless you've been to one, uh, it's kind of unclear what actually happens. All you know is that on the other side, there are some students who seem very good and some students who seem like they need more help and, and what's actually going on. And then I did put Shopkick at the end there because I'm a server engineer there now, but um, this won't be about that. Yeah, it's, uh, it's been great so far. I also apologize ahead of time. This is going to be the least Pythonic Peninsula presentation you'll ever see, but hopefully uh, you still see it as relevant. And that's interesting. Is it coming up that way? Uh, okay, all my slides are slightly zoomed in. Ooh, I didn't even. Wow. All right. Well, again, uh, I, okay, sure. You know what? We're just, we're just going to keep going. So uh, two central questions. First of all, what are the schools? Uh, and even, even uh, Googling boot camp logos, I was like, oh my goodness, there, there are dozens of them, right? And then usually there, there's, there, there are kind of themes to the logos. There's some sort of clever, almost geometric thing going on. And then there's a word like dev or app sometimes coding, sometimes it's a mountain, sometimes it's a dojo, sometimes it's a camp, sometimes it's just, a, just an action word, like galvanize. Uh, and then also, I don't know if anyone notices, and <laughs> since it's slightly zoomed in apparently, uh, you can't see all of them, but uh, at least two of these schools no longer exist. Does anyone know which ones or want to shout one out? Uh, someone just pointed to one correctly. Uh, yeah, the Iron Yard is gone, unfortunately. It was actually, they had a really interesting mission, but uh, I guess they ran out of money. Is, and, is iron like a cursed word? Did Flatiron School also like disappear? Well, the, Flatiron School apparently is doing really well. So I've, I've mm -hmm. been following media coverage of these coding schools for years, and I don't know, like, I don't know, like, what happened, but the New York Times is in love with Flatiron School. Anytime that you read a coding article, a coding camp article uh, in the New York Times, it'll be like, they all suck, everything sucks, it's all a scam. But there's Flatiron School. They're a full stack, 12 week, like, you know, the same pitch. They have a 95% placement rate. Uh, let's get to some of those commonalities because I know 
even for me as someone who went to a coding school, it's disorienting. I can't imagine coming from traditional CS or recruiting what it feels like. So you, you find one of these logos, you click on one of the sites, and uh, this is, so I had, I had to say there is some Python in this talk. That's why this corny joke is up here. Um, you click on it, and they're like, all right, you're going to learn how to learn in three different interviews. Uh, I was told that uh, for schools I interviewed at. Or maybe you're going to learn how to Google. You're going to work on your Google Foo. Uh, you're going to learn how to build your skills fast because tech is a developing industry. And you know, you're going to learn how to grow in your company because, you know, I, I mean, I, I'm sure you've heard this all before. Um, okay, this is actually bad because I can't see all of the things. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, this is good enough. Okay, cool. So um, they go... So, so especially if you read about them, they usually say 12 to 14 weeks, but that isn't actually true. Um, Holburn is at least nine months and sometimes two years. There's another school in Fremont, I want to say, called 42, and that's three years long. So most often uh, these programs are 12 to 14 weeks, but there's actually uh, quite a bit of, of variation. Um, and then they're, they're usually in person. There are online ones, but I don't know anything about them, so I'm not talking about them as much. Um, and they're, they're often blended. So you'll get a 12 to 14 week school, but there's actually kind of like a secret three week school ahead of time where you have like very specific prerequisites and they're checked and there's online grading and you need to get all that done before you show up. Um, and then of course they're themed. Some of them are themed almost entirely around mobile development, uh, like make school. Some of them are front end ish. Uh, I think for marketing purposes, none of them want to say that. So they'll say like we're a full stack JavaScript school, which of course is possible, but usually what that means is they're, they're, they're front end, but you know, they're front end ish. Um, there's data science. I know galvanize and uh, I think a couple of others have um, like straight up, we will prepare you for junior data science. And then um, there's full stack, but short uh, coding Dojo is an example of that where they um, they're like, we're going to give you like a full stack CS background, but by the way, it's 14 weeks. Uh, and then there's, uh, ones that try a little bit more to be traditional CS, um, and uh, 42 and Holberton are like that. So th those are what the schools are. I'm going to talk about how they like how the learning actually occurs later. But the next question, we'll see if the forward button works. Yeah, well, that was pretty good. Um, next question is who are the students? So especially if you're new to this, you click on it, and I swear there's one guy who does all the photos for all of the coding schools, and there's some smiling person either sitting at a laptop or uh, at a desktop or both. Usually the, the, the name of the school is like on a sticker or just like somehow on the computer itself conveniently within view of the camera. And like, and, and, and people are really smiling. And then, uh, I mean, it's about it, right? There'll be some, there'll be some testimonials. I don't, I don't think it actually gives you a sense of, um, of who goes to these schools, right? It's so like, it's, it's not only so positive, but it's so uniform that, again, even for me as someone who went to one of these schools, uh, it, it's hard to actually figure out, like, who are the human beings who actually go to these schools? And, of course, um, I spent years going to meetups, and I went to a school, so I'd like to think I have experience in knowing who the human beings are who go to these schools. So I'm going to give you uh, a couple of um, archetypes that are very common. And uh, one of the things that's most surprising when I talk to, to people I don't know why that's happening. One of the things that's most surprising when I when I uh, talk to people about these schools um, is, is people don't know the uh, like actually a large number of, of um, people who go to these these boot camps uh, essentially use them as finishers. So we'll go through all these archetypes, but um, the first one is uh, you get people actually have like really strong STEM backgrounds, and then sometimes uh, actually have a decent amount of coursework done in, in CS. Holborn had a couple of of um, people who had either almost completed CS degrees or actually completed CS degrees and wanted uh, you know, practical industry experience or whatever. Um, and uh, you, you get a lot of people who uh, have degrees from pretty prestigious schools in different engineering fields, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, which was surprising to me. Um, I thought you could just go straight into coding if you're like that. And they, and they see one of these boot camps as a finisher, as opposed to this is where I'm going to learn computer science. It's um, I did electrical engineering. I have a couple of CS classes under my belt, but um, I haven't built a lot of projects. I'm having trouble getting interviews. I want to be a programmer. I'm going to go to one of these schools to finish. Um, 
And uh, sometimes the students are actually quite good. And then I talk to them and I'm like, you know, like you have an amazing GPA and a degree in electrical engineering. And you've, you've built these projects before. How are you not able to like find a, like an internship, like an entry level internship? And then they often say, uh, I'm really shy and I want, I want help with networking. Uh, and uh, then there are, there are sorcerers. These are marketed very heavily, but they do exist. Um, I'm, I apologize for making a Dungeons and Dragons reference, but you know, like if any of you have played Dungeons and Dragons, <clears throat> um, the sort like there are wizards and the wizards study magic and then they can use it. Sorcerers are people who who have like really really strong innate um, magical abilities and they just need some practice. Um, and you will find a couple. They're pretty rare, but you will find a couple of these pretty much regardless of of the boot camp. Um, we certainly had a couple of them at Holberton. And they're just really, really, really good intuitive programmers. They should have been programmers, but for some reason, um, they, they, they went to art school first. Um, and then they usually have a lot of really interesting personal projects, and they work their butts off because they are obsessed with programming. And they're always at the school. And then you know the, the PR guy comes and takes a bunch of pictures of them in the school because they're from art school and they're kicking butt. And then they get hired. And then they do a great job, and it's like, wow, this school like motivates people, and this this programmer kicks butt. And then you hire from that school, and the person you hire doesn't actually do very well, and you're like, what's the like what's going on? Again, it's because you've got all of these different archetypes going into the black box. So I'm sure I'm running out of time, so I'll speed it up. Um, you get the 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 career changers. Uh, I'd probably put myself there. I had um, I did take well, I took a couple of classes uh, online actually in CS before going to Holberton. Um, I have some context. I don't have a hard STEM background, but we did you know, math, and I was teaching math, and I uh, did statistics and stuff for Earth Sciences. Uh, yeah, you dabble, and then, uh, and then, excuse me, you go to the school. And then you get the people who are actually quite new to this. Um, and uh, I talked to them at the meetups, too, and then uh, they often express surprise at the percentage of people within their coding schools who are actually quite new to this. And we're going to return. We're going to return to this because I think this is one of the like biggest areas of potential and one of the current problems. I'll just say it with uh, the, the the boot camps, so to speak. So what happens when the students go to school? Um, well, you get a lot of this. I don't know who that guy is, but they're all uh, they're all staring. That's that's a, that's me. I guess it's not a it's not a big enough picture for me to make that joke. Um, but. Uh, but you, you, you have all these different, you have all this different marketing, and then you have all these different archetypes. The, pretty much regardless of the marketing um, for the school, what happens is you show up and it's group work. Direct instruction is pretty rare. Again, um, it's about learning how to learn, learning how to Google. And you get some sort of intro to CS, and that can vary from being that mandatory prereq course to just being like months um, if, it's a, if it's a longer school. And then you jump into projects. And again, the projects are, are, are group work. And, um, and it's very, uh, very open-ended. Here's an objective. Here are some resources. This is what you should do. Um, almost every school I interviewed with uh, presented pretty much the same thing. Now, why did I bother to mention Common Core in my first slide? Um, there has been a debate going on <laughs> since uh, Common Core standards were uh, implemented, uh, at least partially in the United States about how math should be taught. And so back in 2011, 2012, when I was teaching, well, 2013, 2014, I taught for a while, um, there were all these discussions about like, what we really need to do is we need to architect some higher level concepts in math, and then we need to give the students group work, and then we need to leave them alone. Because group work and conversation, it like enables like this like very authentic intuitive learning of these higher level math concepts, and it's just a better model than what we have now. And I'm definitely not saying that's wrong, and that works spectacularly for um, some people, but it's, uh, it, it's basically the less, the less mentorship you have in math at home, like the more scared you are of math, the more, uh, the more support you need from the teacher. And uh, so there have just been debates been raging for years now in STEM education about how much help you give the students if you want to move to this uh, more libertarian learning environment. Um, and then just a couple of other things very quickly. Uh, the, the, most of the coding schools know that they need to teach something that's not taught at a lot of traditional colleges. And uh, usually there's the, they end up adding some sort of 
some sort of version control, everything, every assignment's on, on GitHub and you have to do your group projects in GitHub and you need to learn like how to do um, uh, a pull request and how to review someone else's pull request, that sort of thing. Um, you usually in some, in some way, shape or form uh, work on deployment. And so uh, like uh, at least when I interviewed at Coding Dojo, they basically have three full stack projects and then you deploy them to a server, and at least in theory, you learn deployment. And then, yeah, you're going to talk. You're you're going to do some whiteboarding, pretty much no matter where you go. Um, and then, they, usually, they also practice the heck out of classic CS interview questions, um, which is, I think, relevant for the recruiters, which we will uh, get to. So, and then what happens? Uh, speaking of marketing, I also thought this was funny. Uh, Course Report does uh, a lot of coverage right now of the coding schools. And I honestly forget which one of these is actually from Course Report, but they did this thing where they had like student spotlights and they did a format like that. And then every coding school in the Valley took that formatting. So if you go on any of their websites, you see uh, once again what, what appears to be made by the same guy, which is the student spotlight. And again, the student spotlight is usually on a sorcerer because those are such good marketing for the coding schools. Um, but yeah, so what happens? What happens when you have this, uh, like when you, you take what sometimes is like actually curriculum wise, seemingly pretty good uh, computer science curriculum, and you, you put it on a computer in a computer lab somewhere in Silicon Valley, you bring in all of these, these students and you say, uh, you know, get to work, uh, time to learn to code. Uh, and at, le at least from what I've seen uh, and from talking to people uh, for, about this for years, uh, the finishers, the people who already had uh, degrees in math or engineering and had or some formal co uh, coursework in CS or both uh, they tend to finish and then and then they do well and they interview well and you don't really have to worry about them um, the sorcerers and sorcel and again there's a lot of there's a lot of hype about that because uh, the because it's really exciting when you take someone who does not have a lot of traditional uh, CS background a lot of CS ability um, and then and then have them do them what uh, do really well and then uh, for the career changers, it's a little more mixed. And then for the people who are actually new to programming, which is usually central to the marketing for the coding schools, um, I, I think it's very mixed. Some people, uh, some people crush it, some, some people don't. And um, I guess from a recruiter's perspective, you don't necessarily care. You just pick, you pick the ones who, who crushed it. But one of the points that I want to make is that uh, some of these schools actually have curriculums that are extremely promising, and if uh, if the the industry works with them on basically teaching and support and making sure that the people who are actually new to the coding schools um, keep up with the material and keep motivated, um, I think you can you can see these outcomes uh, get a lot better. Uh, but one thing again, when when I go to to meetups or uh, to bars or whatever that uh, recruiters start asking me, or engineering managers ask me, ask me is uh, how do you actually differentiate between any of this? So we talked about some of the archetypes that go in, we talked a little bit about how things are actually taught, but um, like what do you do, right? If you're, if you're an engineering manager and you're at least considering one of these schools, uh, and, and for the record, I, I think you should, what do you do? Um, uh, the first thing I would do is I, I wouldn't, take anything from chapter one of cracking the coding interview. Uh, regardless of the format of the school, it's very common to practice the heck out of the very, uh, just you know, reverse a link list or basic questions about binary trees, basic questions about big O, even though some of that might seem like traditional CS, uh, regardless of whether the, the coding schools are doing a good job. And again, some of them definitely are. Uh, so I hope this didn't seem too critical. Uh, my point is, Regardless of whether or not the coding school is doing a good job, they're probably going to know the answers to these. Uh, so uh, even, even though it might only be a 14-week program, you should expect that any of those questions are going to be answered pretty easily. So um, I, would, I would personally recommend, uh, in terms of technical interview questions, asking about some of the, uh, some of the more open-ended concepts. So uh, a question where you really emphasize like like modularity. This is going to be where your piece of code fits in the program. Can like can you think about that? Can you reason about that? Um, can you make it readability? 
uh, readability. Can you make it readability? Can you make it readable? Can you make it rewritable a little bit? Like if I give you these three requirements and then I add a requirement, uh, can you in, can you work with that? Can you change that on the spot? Um, I think that you're likely to get a better signal from that. Um, if one of the schools seems interested to you in, in you, or geez, excuse me, if you seem interested in one of those schools uh, or recruiting from them, they often love sending you students or they love having you come for an on-site interview. Uh, so just contact them. Uh, if, if, you, if you look at one and you're like, hey, this looks pretty good, uh, I promise you they will send you five students to talk to in a minute. So, you know, take them. Talk to them uh, and see what you think. And, uh, yeah, I, I, think it's a, I think it's a very interesting area. Uh, I've really, I've been reading every article that comes up on uh, Google News for it for years, uh, but this is my first time presenting on it. So uh, if you think that, basically if you have any thoughts, just uh, talk to me after this, or ask me a question right now. Very interesting presentation. I'm sure that there are some very interesting questions now. Oh, we got one over there, okay. I'll ask one in the meantime. What are the revenue models of these schools? Uh, that's a that's a totally fair question. So, yeah, I should probably include that because well, it's interesting to me at least. But all of this is interesting to me. Um, they they kind of vary, and so the most common one is you put down a deposit of several thousand dollars, which usually was not initially part of the school, but after a couple of iterations, they decided to have it. You put the you you put down a model of several thousand dollars. There's a grace period of uh, a month or two after you're finished with the program in which you're expected to job hunt. And then there's a lump sum, usually between ten and $20,000 that you pay in installments. Uh, and then some go by percentage instead, typically. Uh, what, what school, I, I didn't really get it from the talk, sorry if I missed it. What school did you go to and what sort of language was it focused on? And then is now that what you do in your day job? Uh, yeah, fair enough. Um, I went to Holberton and uh, the, the primary language is there. We like, since it's longer, they have time for like a more of a traditional CS curriculum. So it's like uh, relatively traditional CS and C for three months, and then uh, a little bit of JavaScript and a lot of Python. And sure enough, Shopkick, believe it or not, uses a lot of Python. So um, that transition's been pretty smooth for me. Uh, so which, uh, which archetype does Mahmoud fit? I didn't go to coding school. Don't loop me into this. Uh, <laughs> Mahmoud is both a finisher and a sorcerer because he's I very good finish my MBA and natural. What did you say? I didn't finish my MBA. That's one thing I didn't finish. <laughs> okay. uh, but I did finish my CS degree. I got a minor in business. I see. Just curious, which would focus on data science or statistical applications, or does it ever get to that? That level. Are you asking which which schools focus yeah. on that? Uh, so I Galvanize. I know Galvanize does. Okay. Um, this is something that I personally haven't been that interested in. I just like I love like making games and stuff in Python. So I don't I don't want to uh, I, don't, I don't want to call myself an authority on that. Um, Galvanize definitely does. Metis is another one. M E T I S. Um, and I don't know if anyone else knows any off the top of their head. Those are the those are the two that I always hear about in the news. Okay. Thanks. Are you interesting, interested in attending one? Exploring. All right. And so, do you, are you are you partisan in this? Do you have any recommendations? Um, I really so. Uh, I just I just don't want to do that. I feel like because I went I went to one, I can't I can't play that game. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you. you I'll tell you. Know me in person. Yeah. Th there's this one forty two. And despite the number, they will not take anyone over the age of 30. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I, um, so, I, so, I disagree so, with yeah. decision 42. Nar narrow to the decision tree I, there. I guess I, I will say this. I will say this. Um, I floated around enough in the meetuposphere long enough before going to the school that um, I got to know people and I got to see them go through App Academy and Coding Dojo and Coding House, which is also now defunct, and Dev Bootcamp and a number of other ones. Uh, and the one thing I can say for sure is um, like make sure that you've taken a, a couple of, I, th I think online resources are actually really good right now. I think MIT's online resources are great. I think Coursera and edX have a lot of good stuff. Um, I would start there. 
uh, both in terms of the outcomes at the end and just like having a positive experience in the schools themselves, the strongest, uh, the strongest signal that I've seen was completion of a couple of those courses. Um, and also for whatever it's worth for the recruiters, um, I, wanted to, I wanted to include outcomes data in this presentation, but it's like so, it's always so fuzzy and you're like, mm, I don't really trust that percentage. But the one thing that like in like the New York Times and the Economist and the coverage of these schools that comes up again and again is at least according to those outlets, the most, the, the, uh, most reliable positive signal for a boot camp graduate is not whether they graduated from the boot camp, but whether or not they completed a couple of those courses beforehand. And you're talking about online courses. Yeah. So like, uh, like the, the very first, the very first course I took uh, a while ago was just intro to computation and programming with Python, which is on edX for free and uh, very common. So it runs the course runs all the time. So everyone should go download my O'Reilly course, Enterprise Software. With oh yeah, Python. I'm sorry, I forgot. I forgot. The first thing I took was <laughs> Mockmode. That would be a very uh, strong signal to me. Uh, so, <laughs> anyways. Uh, yeah, I mean, speaking of like Malcolm's data, like I looked at some outcomes data of traditional education, right? I was surprised by some of the numbers. 9% of computer science uh, degree holders are currently not employed. Uh, and another one uh, that was interesting is that um, only 55% of people with law degrees are employed full time. <laughs> so, so you can understand some of that career changing thing there. Anywho, uh, but no, very interesting presentation. Mark, did you have one question? Oh, he had a quick question. We have a second, sure. So you said it, it, that the, like, the process of teaching resembles common core, so you have a lot of group work, so you're gonna get some direction at the beginning and then mm -hmm. send a couple of people off and to corner and have them yeah. go for it. So what, if somebody gets like, stuck on, especially for the CS intro stuff, mm -hmm. um, if somebody gets stuck on a concept, what kind of support is there from like, the actual teacher or teachers are their office hours is it like can you call somebody over and be like uh yeah what indeed um so usually usually there's a protocol and often uh if you're applying to a billion coding camps you become interested in that question and you ask them they'll answer but the pattern the pattern generally goes um that that they they define some sort of workflow for you here's what you should do before asking uh one of one of the teachers and then that workflow usually looks like you've thought about it you've googled it you thought about it again, you've consulted the recommended resources. Um, but you do get into that game, which I saw again as a math teacher, which is one reason I got interested in this, which is that the, the people, the, if you haven't taken a couple of courses, if you're, if you're actually new to it when you go into one of these schools, and a lot of them again market themselves as like, you can do that, um, you, you definitely see the too embarrassed to ask phenomenon. And I haven't seen, or I haven't heard of people like being pressured not to ask, um, there was a reference in the New York Times that happening at Dev Bootcamp. I have no idea if that's true, uh, but you definitely see people who are like, well, I followed the procedure, but you know, even though it's day one, I don't want to ask what a Boolean is, or I don't want to ask what a for loop is, uh, and then they don't. And it's too bad, in my opinion. It's sad. That's interesting. Mark, you, uh, you, you, tr you changed careers. What was your title before you got a software engineering job at eBay? I was, I was a graduate student. In Arabic literature. <laughs> he can speak Arabic. Oh, question here? You got one. Yes. Um, so uh, my question was, uh, what did it look like for you after the boot camp ended? And the reason I asked is because I attended like a boot camp like thing like about a year and a half ago. And I got a job like a month ago in something unrelated to what I did the boot camp in. Right. And uh, what made the difference for me is like learning how to career search. I actually took another like boot camp sort of focused on like that uh, teaches you how to like career search for programming jobs specifically. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, yeah, so I I'm just kind of curious like what your like kind of process was afterwards. Uh, sure. And let me say something real fast. Uh, Thank you for mentioning that. I should have included that in the presentation. A lot of the boot camp people you talk to have already gone to a boot camp. Um, but uh, so I, I said I was going to remain nonpartisan. I would I would say that that Holborn's networking is pretty good. And so I had they they basically set me up for a couple of interviews, and a couple of them I really blew. Uh, but you know I got I got used to that process. Uh, and then and then basically by virtue of coming to a bunch of these meetups, I met Moshe and Mahmoud. Um, I don't really wanted to work for them, so that worked out nicely. But yeah, that, oh, sorry, I didn't completely answer that question. That was that, that time span was about a month and a half. 
Nice. Yeah, if I start a boot camp, I'm going to do it a little bit different. I'm going to use that picture of you where no one is smiling and there are no logos uh, in the picture. Well, that, that was a journalist, not a PR person. That's why I like that. <laughs> That's the real story. Everyone just frowning, no teachers present, trying to like get a question through Stack Overflow without it being closed as duplicate. <laughs> uh, anyways, okay, cool. So yeah, we're heading into, well, again, thank you, David, for sharing that experience.